Tucson, Arizona, January 8, 2011. A lone gunman carrying a semi-automatic handgun with a large capacity 32 round magazine opened fire on Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords and the children and adults lined up to meet her. In moments, 19 people were shot, including the Congresswoman. Frantic calls went out for immediate help. She's breathing. She was breathing. She still had the pulse, and we got two people. And we got, we got one dead. Among the first responders were units from Northwest Fire and Rescue District, trained and ready for such an emergency. En route, crews planned their actions based on reports from the scene. Through training exercises, they knew a tragedy such as this would require a large commitment of personnel and resources. Arriving quickly, the unit staged nearby until Pima County Sheriff's Office had secured the crime scene. Their mission, rapid triage, treatment, and transport of patients to definitive care, plus a continuing responsibility to maintain coverage in the fire district. Cleared into the scene, the firefighters found 19 shooting victims, six of them dead or dying, and numerous other individuals seriously traumatized by the event. Incoming crews were directed to patients based on the severity of their injuries. Head and chest wounds were rated immediate. Extremity wounds without profuse bleeding were rated minor. Northwest Fire and Rescue established an effective incident command structure. As senior officers arrived on scene, they were incorporated into the structure wherever they could be the most help. The focus of Northwest Fire and Rescue personnel was totally patients first. Knowing that trauma patients survive best with surgical care, they worked to transport patients to definitive care facilities as quickly as possible. As other transport options were available, a command decision was made not to use Northwest Fire District rescue companies for transport in an effort not to take rescuers away from the scene. Among the factors contributing to the success of the first responders at this tragic incident were excellent and continual training, adequate staffing, four-person engines and two-person rescue vehicles, experience and training of incident command personnel, early recognition of the enormity of the disaster and a timely request for adequate resources. There is no question that a number of shooting victims, including Congresswoman Giffords, are alive today due to the rapid, effective, and heroic actions of Northwest Fire and Rescue. On behalf of the Northwest Fire District and Local 3572, we're honored to be here today to speak with you to pass on our experiences to you. A little bit about the Northwest Fire District. Uh, we're a medium-sized fire district uh, situated in the northwest portion of Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we serve 140,000 residents over about 135 square miles. Uh, we've got 10 full-time stations, one, one seasonal wildland station, uh, 250 uniformed personnel, um, internationally accredited agency since 2007, ISO Class 3. We're a full-service, all-risk, fire-based EMS platform. Uh, ALS uh, component on all of our apparatus. There you go. This is an overview of the incident that morning. A typical strip mall that you would see in, in, in most communities. Uh, Safeway grocery store uh, with uh, an adjoining Walgreens next to it. Morning of January 8th, Congresswoman Giffords uh, was meeting, holding uh, what she calls a Congress on your corner in our community. Uh, the event started at 10 o'clock in the morning. At 10:10, phone calls started bringing into the Sheriff's Department's 911 center, which is the primary PSAP uh, for our community, reporting shots fired. What we'll learn. What we eventually learned was that multiple shots were fired, 32 shots in fact were fired uh, within 18 seconds. Every bullet hit its mark, not one single bullet missed. Every bullet that was fired struck an individual. Uh, 
That was the original 911 call, and like I said, uh, 25 calls uh, came in within the first uh, within the first 15 to 20 seconds of the shooting having occurred. For, the sheriff's department was fully aware. Uh, the calling party had had advised that Gabrielle Giffords, Congresswoman Giffords, had been shot. That information was not passed on to us. Uh, the information that was passed on to us uh, was, in fact, uh, that folks had been shot. We didn't later learn uh, that it, in fact, had been Gabrielle Giffords. You'll see a photo, giant banner uh, hanging out in front of the grocery store uh, welcoming Congresswoman Giffords. That's not anything that any of us picked up on. Uh, in fact, the paramedic who was attending to Congresswoman Giffords had no idea who she was until after he had returned back to the, back to the scene which in, in, in my mind is a testament to the focus uh, of our folks. It really matters not who it is that's, that's sick or injured. Uh, matters not their, their, their status in the community or status in society. Uh, call to duty, uh, we respond, we take care of everybody equally and appropriately. Shooting gets dispatched at 10-11. Uh, Sheriff's Department and neighboring law enforcement agencies respond. Uh, they were, the Sheriff's Department did a phenomenal job, and this is, this is a discussion that we have with them, a uh, presentation that we provide mutually with the Sheriff's Department. Um, they did an exceptional job. Uh, they need to get uh, considerable credit as well. The neighboring police agencies uh, are around there responded as well. A couple uh, motor officers from uh, neighboring police department were writing a traffic ticket on the side of the road when somebody pulled up and said, hey, there's a bunch of people shot down the road. Uh, they took off. They were some of the, uh, some of the initial law enforcement officers into the scene. At 10:14, uh, we dispatched a full alarm medical that essentially consists of a battalion chief and EMS captain, three engines, uh, one rescue, uh, command uh, notification page goes out, uh, three transports as well, and three helicopters uh, were placed on standby as the, as the initial uh, response. 1014, uh, first law enforcement officer arrives on scene, immediately takes the, uh, the suspect into custody. Uh, we don't get cleared uh, to move into the scene until uh, we're on scene at 1019 holding off, but we don't get cleared to move in until a few minutes later. There was some concern that there was uh, a, a second shooter. Um, once they were uh, sure, or at least thought that there was not a second shooter, they cleared us to move into the scene, at which point there then became some elevated concerns that, in fact, uh, there was, in fact, a second shooter, which resulted in a complete lockdown uh, of the area while our crews were in the process of, of uh, treating and packaging. As the Sheriff's Department arrived on scene and uh, cleared us to move in, they began uh, deploying uh, what they call the IFAC kits, which are, which are first aid kits uh, that the Sheriff's Department has. Uh, these kits uh, contain a lot of materials that are designed to treat uh, essentially penetrating trauma. This is something that uh, we actually, uh, on the fire department, we've got several tactical paramedics, one of which uh, is actually uh, was there with Kyle that day uh, doing triage. and. Uh, he, and in fact, uh, as part of our relationship with the Sheriff's Department, assisted with the training process uh, to put these kits together that the Sheriff's Department deployed. Engine 331, 
So at this point, uh, command is being established uh, at 1022. So at this point, we're putting in place a, a simple incident command structure. Uh, we're four minutes into it. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a triage count, which was ongoing uh, throughout the incident. Uh, Kyle will come up in a moment and talk about his experiences with the triage side of things. But we're putting in place a simple incident command structure. Uh, the incident commander at the time, who's actually uh, pictured uh, in, the, uh, in the red Ford truck there, his mindset was, this is a complicated issue. Uh, I don't want to complicate it any further. I want to keep this as simple as possible, uh, and let's move through this. This isn't, this isn't the first time that we've had uh, a mass casualty incident. I can tell you it is the first time that we've had a mass casualty incident that involved shooting victims. Uh, normally it's rollovers, things of that nature, uh, but this, is, this type of trauma we had not seen previously, uh, and his mindset was, I want to keep this simple uh, in working with medical, Medical made a determination very, very early on. You could see four minutes into it, our triage is done. We're, we're starting a second alarm, which is a doubling of the original units that were there on the first alarm, uh, that we needed to keep our, keep our treatment to, the primary goal was definitive care. The only way we're gonna get definitive care is if we provide the necessary treatment to these, to these victims as quickly as we possibly can and get them off the scenes to the, to the appropriate uh, uh, treatment facilities. At this point, I'm going to have Kyle come up and talk about his experiences. Kyle was one of the triage officers uh, uh, on the first two engine company, Engine 330. Thank you. Um, that morning, uh, I was on Engine 330, and uh, we typically have four people on our engines. That morning, we had uh, our Captain Roger Moore, myself, uh, was driving, and Tony Campagno, who is our, uh, our paramedic. We had a probationary firefighter that morning who uh, took the first four hours off to attend a funeral, so we were running short. We only had three that morning. When we arrived on scene and we were held off by PCSO, we had a good few minutes, I think it was probably two to three minutes, where we were able to sit in the engine and talk about what we were going to do. We were able to plan ahead. We figured we'd be assigned triage, uh, being it in our first two area, and we had were able to to talk about and formulate a plan of how, what we were going to do. Uh, so for us, triage started in the engine before we even got on scene. Uh, once we got there, uh, we were cleared by SO and we moved in. We got out of the truck and. Tony Campagno, our paramedic, 16-year medic, SWAT medic experience, had the start triage bag around his waist, and we started heading uh, up to the, the hot zone. We were approached by bystanders and citizens that were helping, as well as, as police officers 
uh, coming right up to us asking us or, or pointing to who we needed to go to or what they thought. And, and we, we basically kind of ignored them and just went in to do what we had to do, and, and that was to triage the victims. Um, we, we knew going in that definitive care is where these, these people needed to be. Tony took the lead on the triage. He started to look through the triage bag, the start triage bag, and realized that wasn't going to work. Um, we weren't going to have time. We had so many resources and staging ready to come in and start treating those patients that once we were able to identify that head and chest wounds needed the, uh, the highest level, it was quick to assign upcoming units. Rescue 30 originally was signed triage, or I'm sorry, Rescue 30 was originally signed triage with us. Right off the bat, noticed the head uh, injury that was still viable, and he assigned Rescue 30 to, uh, to treatment of that patient. Uh, the close proximity, I'm sorry, the close proximity and the number of victims um, made it easy to, to do a quick count and get through. Um, but the most important part of that triage was our captain coming in and basically yelling, anybody that can walk uh, or mildly injured, you need to go to the other area. Once that happened, it opened up the scene for us to really get a good look at what we had and get a good count for uh, incident command. As you see in this, this picture, um, the crew's working on that, that individual. Uh, I'll give you on the next slide a um, chance to, to proxent, get, get an orientation of where that patient was. This is the, the Safeway, um, and this is what we, we encountered. That number eight was the, uh, the patient that was in that last picture. That was the first, uh, first one that we had approached and came up to. As you can see, the number of people that were, were shot and injured was in a tight little area, um, and we were able to go through. While we were doing the triage, we did have some, some people that were really incredible. They understood the magnitude of the situation. Um, one lady had three gunshot wounds, one to each arm, one lower back, and she was talking to us with no problem. And we told her, ma'am, we will get to you as soon as we can. And she's like, I understand, just don't forget about me. I see what, we've got, what you've got to deal with. Um, so when it was all said and done, 19 people were shot, five were dead um, on scene, seven immediate, seven minors, six of which were treated and transported, and one of the uh, minors left the scene before we got their POV. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Brad for... Uh, the next slide. So at this point, our triage is complete. Uh, we're working through uh, the, the situation at this point, setting up. Uh, in, in fact, we have all trained to, to uh, we've got our tarps, uh, color-coded tarps and whatnot for treatment, transport areas, and things of that nature. Um, but as it played out, as the scene laid out, there was really no need to set up a separate treatment area. Uh, all the victims were confined, as, as Kyle said, to, a, to a, uh, uh, a very close proximity area, uh, which made that uh, much, much easier for us. Uh, it, we set up the uh, transport areas, brought in helicopters, lined them up uh, right in the middle of the intersection, middle of a major intersection, which, which helped, us, uh, helped us immensely. So at 10.35, medical communications established with all the hospitals. Essentially what we did was bring up all the hospitals on the same channel. We have the ability to do that, uh, get a rundown of how many victims they can take. We have one trauma center uh, in Tucson, and uh, they, did a, they did a phenomenal job that day. Uh, it agreed to take all the immediate patients, and uh, at that point uh, we started loading all the victims for, uh, for ground transport. Overall, first 52 fire department minutes. We have two operational periods uh, that we were working within. The first operational period was, was that of which treatment, uh, triage treatment and transport occurred, uh, scene mitigation, and that occurred for us uh, within 52 minutes. So from the start to the stop, before the 
from the from the first call to 911 to the last patient having left the scene, uh, 52 minutes for us. Again, as, uh, as, as, as Kyle had talked about, uh, 19 patients, six of which died, 13 did survive. Every patient who left the scene alive is still alive and very well today. And that fact is a testament to all the agencies, all of the men and women uh, that responded that day uh, to provide for those in need. We've asked ourselves many, many times, uh, were we prepared for this incident? And why did the response go well? I can tell you that from a preparation perspective, I thought we were exceptionally well prepared. Psychologically, I don't know how, how you can prepare uh, for an incident such as this, uh, with the exception of just continued resourcing, continued training, continued practicing. And with that, I'm going to bring Kyle up to, to get his perspective on, on why he thought this response went well. The reason it went well is simple. We, we train, we're professional, and uh, we've got good relationships, good partners. Um, we recognize the enormity of the situation early. We knew that it, this was something that we've never dealt with before in, in this magnitude, um, and we were ready for that. Our personnel was focused on the tasks that needed to be performed, um, and we didn't get caught up in, in the big picture. We knew what our job was. We knew we needed to take care of this individual patient if that was ours, and, and we did that. Uh, furthermore, we, the relationships that we have at Northwest Fire, we work extremely close with uh, the sheriff's office and uh, other jurisdictions close to us. That call involved 25 local, state, and federal agencies. Uh, we had mutual aid come in from uh, Golden Ranch Fire District, we use Southwest Ambulance, Rural Metro Ambulances. Uh, we had Oro Valley Police Department, Sheriff's Police Department, all within the first few minutes of that incident. And our relationships that we have with each of those organizations really helped the outcome of that, of that situation and, and that call. This picture um, reflects the beginning of the second operational period. This is uh, the picking up the pieces. One of the, one of the big issues that we had uh, after it was all said and done, after the first hour, 52 minutes, was getting crews back into service to, to take care of the rest of our district. But with the law enforcement uh, activity, uh, all our gear had to stay in place. So we had uh, approximately half of our district resources on this call and all the equipment had to stay in place. I don't believe we got our uh, EMS gear back until approximately 10 o'clock at night, um, so 12 hours later. It, it also represents the ongoing um, process that we have to deal with. We had uh, attended uh, every one of the funerals in the area. Uh, we had President Obama uh, fly into Tucson and have a memorial down at the U of A. And it's an ongoing process um, that, that we continue to work through. These are the, uh, the six victims um, that day. Uh, as you can see, they range from uh, 79 to 9 years old. Um, so that, that's how we're going to end today. Um, we will be available for questions later on uh, if you have any questions. On behalf of the Northwest Fire District and Local 3572, thank you again for having us. We're honored to be here.